oxygen to a gas mixture, you're going to have a rebreather. So what can you use rebreathers for? Well, first of all, there's a bunch of advantages because you really only, your V.02, see Bennett and Elliott, um, uh, a medical textbook, has seen V.02s as high as six liters per minute. Realistically, most people are about one liter or a half a liter a minute, give it at a rest at a normal, uh, normal work rate. So a liter or a half a liter a minute, geez, a 13 cubic foot bottle has something like 800 uh, liters of gas in it. That means that effectively at any depth, it will last 800 minutes, give or take. So uh, you can definitely extend the depth of normal open circuit diving, that's for sure. It definitely has a decompression advantage, that's certainly for sure. But I tell you, there is no good without bad. Uh, everything has its downside. So, um, you know, rebreathers can definitely get you in trouble. And I want to walk you through a couple of those right now. But first, I want to talk to you about the Association for Marine Exploration. That's this organization that I told you that I was a CEO of. So we started this organization uh, probably about, gosh, I guess we're going on 20 years now. So it's a Hawaii-based nonprofit corporation and I'm not trying to stem you for money. I'm not looking for donations at this point, but if you feel like giving, feel free to look it up at uh, marineexploration.org. So this is the, this is the actual, um, you know, our statement of what we're supposed to do. This is our position description, uh, our job description, if you will. Blah, blah, blah. What I do want to do, I don't want to read all that to you, but what I do want to do is walk you through the what we do in this organization. So the Association for Marine Exploration has five separate areas of subspecialty. One is ichthyology research or fish research. The other is coral reef research or coral research. The other is benthic geology. Now those are the primary hard sciences. Then there's biomedical engineering because in order to get to these places where we're gonna describe in just a minute, we have to invent a couple of things. We have to do a couple of things that are different. We have to change it up and, and work on it. And the other side of engineering, that's the other red line. Uh, that's what we do is we, we basically design and help design and work with rebreather manufacturers to make their rebreathers better, to be more acceptable, more helpful, uh, more betterer for us, I'm an engineer, remember, not a, uh, not, not a English major, so. Okay, we started this organization with one simple premise and, and that bottom line is we believe that everything we need to survive is here on earth. We've yet to find it. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So I mean that, you know, there's a lot of things that are organic that we can use to, to help us out. So if you look in the ocean, you can see that, guess what? Cold water fish have a natural form of antifreeze in them and we could use that. Um, some fish offer um, these, these antimicrobial peptides, these caps. And, uh, and there's a lot of antibacterial properties in there, broad spectrum antibiotics that are naturally occurring that are right there. Um, they're effective against you know, malignancy, some cancer stuff. Uh, it helps prevent sepsis. This is some really good stuff. And guess what? Naturally occurring in the ocean, in fish that we see every day. Um, some, sea organizations, uh, some sea organisms can help us with some novel delivery agents for medication. It's, it's the part of that delivery system that these fish come up with, part of their acids, if you will. And then, uh, and, and oh, guess what? Barnacles bond pretty heavily to surfaces, right? Everybody who's had a wooden boat knows about barnacles and they, uh, they bond pretty tightly to slippery surfaces. So maybe we could use something with that, uh, surgical adhesives, things that won't ever dry out per se, but um, you know, so they need to continue to be wet. But there's a couple of great uses that we can find. Um, a, a long while back, a long while back, a little while back, uh, I was asked to come out to uh, James Cameron's house and get a uh, evaluation for his submersible at one point uh, after he dove the Marianas Trench. Well, when I did that evaluation, I found out that he had found a sea lice at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Well, normally a sea lice is really teeny tiny, right? Well, this sea lice was, just, you know, about a foot and a half, uh, give or take. And, uh, and this sea lice wound up uh, being, he collected it, brought it back to the surface, and it wound up being a partial synthesized cure for Alzheimer's. That means that we had already synthesized it on the surface, but it was naturally occurring at 35,000 feet. So if you look where you've always looked, you will find what you always find. So look in a different place. And that's our thought process. So here we are at the undersea world. Here's our normal scuba diver and he can maybe go to 50 meters, give or take. I mean, sure, some people can go a little deeper, but not a whole heck of a lot deeper, that's for sure. And then 
pretend you're going to rent a submersible. If you have the money to rent a submersible at $10,000 an hour, for crying out loud, you're going to go to where? You're going to go to the deepest, darkest, scariest place that your submersible can go because, you know, you want to go where it's all sexy and great because obviously nobody's been there before. So that's where most of the submersibles go between uh, uh, deeper than 150 meters. But then we're left with this little zone of, you know, of what we really don't understand. And it's a, uh, it, it, it's the zone between 50 and 150 meters. And, uh, you know, we call it the twilight zone. Why do we call it the twilight zone? Rich Pyle, um, uh, a dive buddy of mine, um, he, he coined this term. And basically it means that when you look up, you, it basically looks like it's twilight out, even though it's the middle of the day. So it's kind of like, it's kind of deep, it's kind of dark, it's a little scary, you know. But we couldn't really call it the twilight zone because, you know, there were other areas on the map that were called the twilight zone. So we says, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna call it deep coral reefs. Well, that's not technically true. So the deep coral reefs name was already taken by other real deep coral reefs. So we had to kind of go with another name. So we're like, oh, we got a great idea. A bunch of scientists get together and we're like, Deeper portions of typically shallow tropical coral reefs. And we're like, oh, geez, nice. this is ridiculous. So we go on and we got help from the federal government because if you can't figure it the heck out, I'm sure the federal government's going to figure it out. So they gave us the least sexy name at all. And we are now Mesophotic Coral Ecosystems. Thank you very much, federal government. And that's what the area between about 50 meters and about 150 meters all over the Indo-Pacific Rim and realistically all over the world because there's there's lots of this this kind of diving all over the world not just the end of Pacific Rim. So if we push on what we do is we find what are we doing we got a tray full of fish and what we find is these kind of fish that are there. So I want to say there were six new species of fish on that tray and that's me a beard ago and a uh, uh, shorter hair and you have to wear glasses when you count fish because you have to measure in millimeters and oh my goodness it's so tiny. All right. So these are the new, these are the amount of fish that we caught. The, the left-hand column is, well, first of all, we have the depth. Obviously you go down to 120 meters. The number of stations that we dropped, the samples that we collected, the new species that we collected, the hours of effort that we've spent there, and then something called new species per unit effort. So basically what that's telling you, if you look at this chart, it's like, we found 27 new species per unit effort. This is ridiculous. So on this half hour long dive, give or take, we found 27 new species. It's ridiculous. But remember, if you look where you've always looked, you're going to find what you always find. So what do you got to do to find something cool? Well, you got to look where nobody's ever looked before. So I don't know, try under a rock, try underneath the whatever, you know. But if you're going deeper, you're going to find things that people haven't seen before. So that is obviously well illustrated in this column. And, uh, and it shows how much, we can, uh, how much we can actually find. The problem is you need to stay down there deeper and longer because geez, you know, a half hour at 120 meters, you're looking at like six hours of decompression. So it's a ton of decompression, uh, you know, and, and lots of bad things can happen even when you're up in the shallows and you're 20 feet from the surface and you have an hour left to decompress, uh, lots of bad things can happen. So, but lots of good things can happen. We also roll through things like the coral, uh, the coral reefs and the corals. So uh, this is a sample of coral. And what I have there is circled a, uh, a tiny little new species and this new species known to science of a seahorse. And if you look just up and to the right of that, I have one hidden right there. I hope you can see that in that little thing, but that's yet another seahorse. And look, look at the size, because you have a penny over there on the right, and you're seeing, well, why are you collecting corals? Why are you collecting octocorals? Why are you collecting other kinds of corals? Well, I'll tell you this about corals. Corals are some of the most interesting things that we've come across in our lifetime. Um, so there is a species of coral, octocoral specifically, that can live in a high carbon dioxide environment it can actually thrive in a high carbon dioxide environment. So things that can thrive in a high carbon dioxide are very interesting to us. Why are they interesting? Well, because we're, I don't care if you believe it or not, but the carbon, 
carbon dioxide levels rising on the planet and that's all there is to it. So we have to learn how to adjust our ecosystem or and ourself, our metabolic rate, our metabolism and so forth to live in a little bit more carbon dioxide to be a little bit more hypercapnic. So there's all kinds of problems that are coming along that, that these octocoral have already solved on their own. So we want to kind of figure out what they're all about. And I mean, these are the most diverse, these are the most diverse creatures I've ever seen. We can take an octo coral from 110 meters. We can transplant it to 10 meters and take the, the stuff that's at 10 meters and retransplant that back down to uh, 120 meters. And it, they can survive and change and adapt. They're a, a crazy adaptive species. So they're really kind of cool. So we're store, we're studying that. What else? We're studying benthic geology. And benthic geology is really cool because those were the tributaries. When the ice age came, those were the cuts that were cut in the, uh, in the undersea uh, system. So what's next for us at the, uh, at the mesophotic coral reef or mesophotic coral ecosystems and, and how do we attack them for the Association for Marine Exploration? We've been talking with Phil Newton and uh, we're looking at his exosuit and you know, we're kind of trying to figure out how we can get there from here on these. These are exceptionally uh, portable, transportable sort of devices. They're very, very lightweight and they're easily mass produced at this point, although they're still high dollar value. But uh, depending on what you get it made from, uh, either uh, aluminum steel or um, uh, tungsten, I can't remember if it's tungsten or not, it might not be tungsten, but it's a heavier gauge than steel, heavier metal than steel. So uh, th those particular suits can take you almost to, uh, I think, 1,500 feet or 1,200 feet. So that's kind of the next step, I think, for the Association for Marine Exploration. All right, well, you said rebreathers, and you could imagine that we take rebreathers to do that 120, 130, 140 meter dive. And uh, I'll tell you, it's pretty deep, dark, and scary once you get down there. But these are the kind of rebreathers that cross the barrier between Navy rebreathers, the one on the left, a Mark 15 with a really cool painted cover, and then uh, the ones on the right, which are the Inspiration and the older version, the uh, Drager Dolphin. So those are, uh, those are a sampling of kind of rebreathers. So let's go into Navy rebreathers. Here's your typical Navy rebreather. And there's a really young Lieutenant maybe, or Ensign Dottori maybe even. We're talking, we're talking a while ago, pre, uh, pre, uh, <laughs> pre hair, let's put it that way. So uh, th this rebreather is used generally for mine countermeasures, uh, explosive ordnance disposal and, and the like. Uh, it's low magnetic resonance, no magnetic signature. So you can basically sneak up on a metal bomb, uh, a metal mine, and you don't have a problem with uh, with it being magnetically attracted to anything. And you're looking at the spheres. I know you are because you go, that looks pretty metal to me. Well, those are actually made from Inconel, so very rare metal, very good combination, and the sphere is the perfect shape for holding pressure. So it's a great combination. The rig is compact. The thing sits entirely on your back. The only thing that's coming over my chest there is the horse collar or the BC that we use in the Navy. So what else does the Navy has uh, rebreathers? Well, this is the Navy's one atmosphere suit. And you go, wait, 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 Joe, you said it's a rebreather. It is a rebreather. So in the back of that big orange cone that you have on the back of that thing with the thrusters and everything that's, uh, that's mounted to it, what you have is two oxygen bottles. And those two oxygen bottles are fed in from metabolic makeup. So this is a very, very crude drawing. I know I'm the worst drawer on the planet. Uh, get over it. It's, it's great because you can't complain because your audience is all on mute. It's perfect. So, but if you take an enclosed space and then you have a sealed collapsible sort of a membrane on the inside, that collapsible membrane, if there's a decrease in pressure, that collapsible membrane will actually shrink. And if that membrane shrinks, it automatically pushes the O2 add button, which keeps the constant partial pressure of oxygen inside the, re inside the rebreather or the one atmosphere suit. So with that, what I want to do is I want to take you on a journey through the, uh, through the one atmosphere suit. Um, when I was in command over here at Deep Submergence Unit as the officer in charge of Deep Submergence Unit, I, uh, I was in charge of the one atmosphere suit. This was my command coin. And uh, I'm going to press play on this video. I'll probably try and narrate it just a little bit, but let's hope it comes through. Oh, yeah. So you may as well take it down with the holy diver. This is you coming out of the tether management system. 
So uh, the pilot in this is my master diver, Dave Glidewell, good cat, and uh, and he's just in his glory having a ball right now. And you're inside that suit. So the suit weighs 1,500 pounds. That's our command central, and it kind of looks like a NASA central. Now, this is my cameo in the video, ready? Right there on the right-hand side, I gave the okay, that's all you get, sorry. <laughs> my guys figured they'd put me in. Remember the tether management system? That was it. And then that orange block that's on top is syntactic foam. That syntactic foam provides alternative buoyancy uh, for, this, for this particular object. Because when you put it in the water, you really want it to be just about yeah, three or four pounds positive. Because if it's kind of, even at max depth, if it's kind of floating up a little bit, if everything goes sideways, you're gonna kind of float to the surface and you have to physically push down to go down. So here's the first time the suits were ever launched underwater together. And this is its main purpose with submarine rescue. So right there, you, you have a Schlieff net and, uh, and it has just a bunch of wires, lines, ropes, uh, and the pilot, the one atmosphere suit pilot who's flying that vehicle has to go down there and cut it and clear it so that the submarine rescue chamber can come on board. Now, this is the old school one. And this is only at like four or 500 feet. So you can tell the, uh, the twilightiness nature of it. And this is what happens when you turn a light on and you see all the sediment at four or 500 feet. <laughs> and then you put it back off and you can see that that's a, uh, that's a mating capacity right on top of what would be a submarine. So this is a test tank up in, uh, up in Vancouver. And this is our test tank right there in deep submergence unit. So my guys fly in and out of the tether management system so that we don't have to carry 2,000 feet of umbilical with us. The TMS goes all the way down to depth and then it just fakes out 100 or so feet. So all you gotta do is drag it on 100 or so feet of umbilical. Now look at, the, look at the manipulators, look at the hands. They open and they close pretty regularly, but that's about all they do. So they open and they close and they turn around 360 degrees. Well, that's great, but right up until the point where you think that you can actually do something with just a pair of uh, just a pair of manipulators that are opening and closing. So people think that it is uh, it is our opposable thumb that sets us apart from the uh, from the rest of the creatures. Well, that's not exactly true because the lobsters aren't further set apart from any other creature, and they have an opposable thumb. So what it does, what our ability to what's called prehense is the most difficult thing that a human can do. It's to touch this finger, touch this finger, this one, this one. So as you can move your thumb across these and be opposite it, the bulk part. So you can't just be a lobster and be able to go like this. If you are, try picking, uh, you know, try picking up a pencil with a uh, pair of chopsticks. So I can tell you that everybody who gets in the suit has that grin smile. And each one of those pieces is uh, milled out aluminum. So you can move the arms, the knees, you can bend your legs, you can bend your elbows. Uh, and like I say, you can open and close your manip. Um, so we got lights, we got recording cameras and so forth and so on. And, uh, and this is called the eye of God view. So this is basically the tether management system looking down upon you as you're working, making sure that nothing's gonna grab you or nothing's gonna you know, push on you. And you have to fly yourself in and out of this tether management system. So it's really kind of a cool, uh, a cool little setup. And uh, once again, that's Master Diver Dave Glidewell. And that's the, uh, that's the overview. So you can see right here, I have three items that are listed. One is a down submarine. And if any of you have this coin, it came from my hand and went into your hand because uh, I was in charge of that unit and I bought those coins and I handed every one of those out through my hand when I had them. So if you have a coin like that, you know that metaphorically, my name is spelled right across the bottom of that submarine. Uh, so basically metaphoric for my career being stuck on the bottom of the ocean. But the other thing that we have there is the SRDRS, the Submarine Rescue System, um, and then the McCann Rescue Chamber. So you saw the McCann Rescue Chamber in action, but I wonder if you know that the, uh, well, there's me inside the one atmosphere suit. That was a great day. That was one of the first days that, that was the first day that I got in the suit. So you see that clamshell, it opens up from the, from the top section. And uh, it's, it's kind of cool because once you get in the suit the first time, they close the suit 
And then it's standard protocol, even though I was the guy in charge, it's standard protocol for the entire team to just walk away. And once they walk away, you have this stark realization that there's 1,500 pounds of suit on you and you can't get out anyway. So you got to know that whatever you're doing requires teamwork. So while you may be the cool pilot, yay, I'm a pilot, ooh, ah, that doesn't make a fat baby's butt because you need that team to get you in and out of that suit to help you with every single thing that you do. So in this suit, you sit on a bicycle seat. So effectively the max duration in the suit is about eight hours. And, uh, and you're sitting on a bicycle seat for eight hours. So people are like, why don't you like to PT uh, riding a bike? And I'm like, well, so there's this really long story about being in this suit for a long time. And you don't wanna be on that because you have to have your feet off the ground because you steer with your feet. It's toe down to go down, heel down to go up and then forward, backward, left and right. So. This, you have to steer it. You have to steer those thrusters that you see there by using your feet. And then your, your hands are free to operate the manipulators, which is, which is great. But like I said, it's trying to, uh, trying to hold on to a, a pencil with a pair of chopsticks. So it's a little difficult. So this is a two-part picture and it means a lot to me. So this is the day that we were finally able to relieve the Deep Submergence Research Rescue Vehicle, the DSRVs. So that's the DSRB being lifted off, and that is my new asset right there, this $100 million conglomerate of metal and steel. And it's basically a remotely operated vehicle, if you will, that can go to, uh, that can go to 2,000 feet effectively. So that's the unclassified version. This is a video that kind of describes the whole system. So I'll let this play, give you a little bit of volume, and. Uh, and we'll see how this goes. It's an overview, so don't quote it. The submarine rescue system is an integral part of the submarine rescue diving recompression system. The submarine rescue system provides a quick response, worldwide capability for rescuing crew members from a submarine that is disabled, pressurized, and trapped on the seafloor. The system is depot based and is capable of being rapidly air transported aboard a C-130, C-141, C-17, or C-5, and can be quickly installed on a Navy or commercial vessel of opportunity. The pressurized rescue module, or PRM, is launched from the vessel of opportunity with two attendants inside. The PRM is a tethered, remotely operated vehicle that is controlled by operators in a topside control van. It can be launched and recovered in up to a sea state five. The system is designed for rescue operations down to 2000 feet of seawater and has forward looking sonar to locate the dis sub and for obstacle avoidance. In addition, an acoustic tracking system for relative positioning of the dis sub and support ship is integrated into the displays on the bridge and control van. The PRM topside operators have full readout of depth, heading and altitude sensors, vehicle status, man compartment life support status, numerous video cameras on pan and tilt mountings, and other onboard systems. The two onboard attendants monitor and control all life support functions in the PRM, including internal pressure, oxygen partial pressure, and carbon dioxide scrubbing. The PRM is designed with an articulated mating skirt for mating to the submarine escape trunk at angles of up to 45 degrees. This allows the PRM to maneuver into the current with thrusters and remain level without an elaborate ballast system. The PRM can affect hyperbaric transfer under pressure with a disc sub internally pressurized to 132 feet of seawater. The PRM mating skirt is designed to allow the submarine's hatch fairing to be opened with the submarine hatch without removing or dismantling the fairing. 16 crewmen per cycle are transferred with the help of the two PRM attendants. Hatches are closed and sealed and the PRM mating skirt is flooded to ambient pressure for demating from the disc sub. The PRM is flown back to the cursor frame with the umbilical acting as a guide. The PRM and cursor frame can mate up to 30 degrees out of alignment. 
The PRM is recovered and aligned in the cradle with pins and then made it to the deck transfer lock. The dis-sub crewmen are then transferred under pressure into the decompression chambers. The dis-sub crewmen are then decompressed in a controlled environment under medical supervision. Dis-sub accidents may occur anywhere in the world and the submarine rescue system is designed to respond quickly by air and sea and with the capability of transferring and treating dis-sub casualties that have been exposed to a hyperbaric atmosphere. So what we saw there was a lot, obviously, but um, what, what we saw there was a uh, system that when you bring those pressurized people back up, they're, they're in what they call a TUP mode or transfer under pressure. So if you had somebody that's pressurized or saturated for three, four days, because my time to first rescue was 72 hours. I had a requirement to get there and be rescuing people within 72 hours from, from notification. And this was like, I mean, this is a great command, but you really couldn't do anything fun for, you know, because you had to fly out at a, at a literally a moment's notice and you would get, uh, you would get the call and we'd divert C5s and C141s out of wherever and we'd bring them down here, load our stuff and then we'd go do our things. So interestingly enough, I got a call when I had just taken over maybe a couple of months into it and uh, you got a call saying that, uh, hey, listen, the President of the United States just got woken up and now you got woken up. We have what we call a submiss. So we're missing a submarine. It's like, you know, how do you miss a nuclear submarine? That's a, that's a big question. Well, this, this commanding officer missed his reporting requirement, which everyone is reporting. They have a requirement to report in regularly. He missed that reporting window. And uh, then, oh boy, rockets red glare went off. I spent several million dollars that night diverting C5s out of Dover, Delaware and uh, Texas to get unloaded and get to me real quick so that we could load our stuff on. And then the guy pops up and he's like, hey, are you looking for me? <laughs> like, yeah, we're all looking for you. As a matter of fact, the world is looking for you, but it's okay, <laughs> you feel free. So we turned the aircraft around, but... Uh, but this was it, uh, and, and I used to say that during this portion of my uh, Navy career, we used to work easily half days. Um, half days from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., just in case you didn't know, and uh, you know, that's what the guys work, so I'd usually be there at five, and I'd usually leave at something like seven or eight. Um, I, I will tell you this, that, uh, that I was a little bit worried about my crew at one point, and um, we, we had a, uh, it's in San Diego, if you can know that, uh, know that water line right there, it's in San Diego. We were working the crew really, really hard, and I told my boss, I said, listen, I think we're working the crew a little hard, and uh, sure enough, I get off at about uh, seven o'clock one night, and I'm going to drive across the bridge, the Coronado Bridge, and there, uh, there's a jumper on the bridge, and of course, if you know Coronado, they close down the bridge, and I'm like, there's a jumper on the bridge, I'm like, wait, what? And I'm like, wait, who is it? And the cop's like, why do you want to know who it is? And I'm like, well, one of my guys, maybe whatever. And I say, he says, well, the guy's been up there since like one o'clock in the afternoon. I'm like, oh, it can't be one of my guys because we didn't even get off until five. So I brought everybody in the next day. I had a safety stand down and I said, listen, uh, we all need to take a deep breath and everybody needs to go the hell home and, uh, and take a little bit of time off because we had been working uh, a good hard amount of time to put this in use for the Navy. So just FYI. And you're going, Joe, what do you mean that's a rebreather? Ah, that is a rebreather. That whole system is a rebreather. It's basically a flying recompression chamber with a rebreather inside of it. So if you can see these four, um, these one, two, three, four, five, six scrubbers, these are carbon dioxide scrubber materials. So sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, barium hydroxide. Um, so they're in this, uh, this container and we force the air through them to scrub out the carbon dioxide. And then, well, where's the bag? Well, right there is the breathing bag. So when you get in that chamber, um, you got to get on this EBS or this emergency breathing system and there's an inhalation and an exhalation. Well, you're basically all breathing in from that bag that you see that's right here in this breathing bag. So that makes it officially a rebreather. <laughs> so it's kind of neat. But uh, like I said, rebreathers are used everywhere. They're like savoir faire. So there's also a lot of use for rebreathers in a spacesuit because a spacesuit is ostensibly a rebreather. It's a rebreather that's 100% oxygen. So if you look at the spacesuit pressure of a, uh, of a US spacesuit, we're at 4.3 PSI. So 
if you guys remember your, uh, your, your principles and your law and your Boyle's law uh, type stuff, right now we're at 14.7 PSI, so we have a reduction to 4.3 PSI to get in that spacesuit that you see right there. So uh, Kevin Jurgensen, myself, Mike Decker, uh, we wrote a paper on electronic life support, uh, controlling biometric monitoring and biometric monitoring for spacesuits. So all of the spacesuits that you see flying today were invented in the 60s and put together in the 70s. So they're that old. I mean, they're older than probably most people on this line, although I don't actually know the physical age of most people on this line. So. Uh, but we designed this new controller that fits on your wrist and uh, put it together and we're actually doing some really cool things. So like I said, you know, we go from aquanaut to astronaut, we're making everybody's lives safer, but there's rebreathers everywhere. Um, look, man, the, if you've ever heard the term shooter shoot and breachers breach, uh, that's basically it. I'm, I'm basically a Navy guy that knows a little bit about diving and rebreathers. So um, you know, if you look at this, rebreathers can be used for a lot of emergency oxygen. It can be used for oxygen in a portable chamber if you're in high altitude mountain sickness or, you know, you have an issue down here, uh, you, you know, on the top of Mount Everest, you can use it. Incidentally, uh, the top of Mount Everest is uh, just, just about the same pressure as a spacesuit. So it's really kind of cool. <laughs> so uh, you could use it for high altitude climbing, hypoxia. We have a patent pending on a, uh, on, a, on a climbing suit for high altitude that basically has a rebreather that's in there uh, that's inside your climbing suit that has the hoses that come out to here, come across to here and go down. And, uh, and we can use that as an emergency stretcher, if you will, for, uh, to get people off the top of Mount Everest in the event something goes sideways. But like I said, I'm just a guy who, uh, who kind of sort of knows a lot about one thing and I just do the same thing over and over and try and plug it into the same equation. You know, oh, square peg, round hole, woohoo! Well, oh. it could be used for mountaineering, mountain climbing, astronauting, aquanauting, any kind of exploration that you can possibly think of. If you've read my paper, uh, there's a certain possibility, even a probability that it can be used for COVID um, because there's a, uh, there's, there's a lot of mechanism of action that, that work uh, in contrast to COVID and stop, uh, stop the systemic inflammatory response that comes from COVID. Obviously it's used to treat DCS and by God, they just look cool. So that's, uh, that's that on rebreathers. So with that and the deep diving adventures that I have, I will open up the floor to any questions through the, uh, through the lovely moderators that we have. And you can ask whatever question you want Barring certain questions for those of you out there. I've looked through the I've looked through the group and I'm like, I see a couple of friends. Would you guys ask me what kind of cheese I eat? I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, so I'm gonna um, stop your sharing just so we can see your wonderful smiling face larger for asking questions. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so okay, so I've got quite a few questions. Oh my I'm God. I, uh, what would you expect? <laughs> okay, so first from Kurt Tid, um, Joe, were you consulting during the initial rescue efforts of the Argentine submarine ARA San Juan? I was in Miami at the time and learned a lot, of, a ton about the fly flyaway capabilities and vessels of opportunity options. Um, so I was not, I had, uh, I had been passed an opening at that point and, uh, and you know, I had left the building by that point. Uh, so I was working at special operations command. So no, I did not, but I know a little bit about it. Not a whole heck of a lot, but there was some really cool things going on out there. So we were looking really hard for that. Sub, so, so. Excellent. Okay. Um, from Harrison, how much bottom time do you have, including scuba, sub dives, gym suit, et cetera? Oh my gosh, <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea. I can tell you, I can tell you it's a lot. Um, I, have a, uh, I have about 25 hours in the suit, uh, which requires 20, 21 hours to be a pilot, I think it was. And uh, I have just over the minimum. So I don't want anybody to ever think that I'm like this, ooh, he's a superb pilot. No, I'm like, barely qualified as a pilot, but I was in charge. So the guys felt the need to put me in the suit and that was it. So, <laughs> but I got a lot of bottom time. It's just, you know. Excellent. Excellent. How long have you been diving in general? <laughs> Interesting story. Um, and I'll take 30 seconds, a uh, couple minutes of your time. <laughs> 
So, uh, so my dad just passed. So I want to tell this story to kind of commemorate him. I was uh, I was about ten years old, and my dad had a really big boat on Long Island in New York. We, we grew up in New York, and uh, you know we used to fish all the time. So if you wanted to hang out with dad, you had to go fishing, and that was it. So I was going fishing with my dad, and you know we didn't watch football, we didn't do anything on Sundays except fish, or Saturdays or Sundays except fish. And uh, the problem was is that he had some kind of a wobble in the rotation on the shaft of his really big boat. I mean, it was like 30 feet. It wasn't easy to pull out of the water. So he sends me underwater with a mask and an Allen key, and I got to go underneath and I got to get this little zinc tab, which is wrapped around the shaft, and I'm trying to undo it and undo it and undo it. I'm, I'm 10 years old. I can barely hold my breath for like a minute. I, I give, it's a minute. It's a long time. It's probably more like 30 seconds. So. I come up and I'm like, dad, I just, I just can't do it. I can't do it. He goes, okay, come up here. Get out of the water, you idiot. Right? So then he brings this double hose regulator and we're talking 70, a ballpark and say 75, 77, something like that. Um, and, and he puts this double hose regulator on me, which is my uncle John's regulator and a tank, which has not been moved from the shed since Christ was a corporal. I mean, we're talking a long, long time. He puts this whole setup on me, no BC. And it's just this thing that comes over my shoulders. <laughs> and then I go underwater and I'm breathing in and out. And my first scuba diving lesson, my only scuba diving lesson at that point was, oh, by the way, don't hold your breath. And I'm like, okay. So I go underwater, I'm sitting in the mud in the canal in New York. With, with a freaking shopping cart next to me and, and you know like an old refrigerator to the left and I'm I'm taking this zinc tab off you know trying to get this allen key in there and take the zinc tab off and this fish comes up to me and hits me right in the mask it's like some little perch or something stupid but it's like you know you can imagine it's disgusting and I'm like I love this this is the greatest thing I'm doing this for life <laughs> so yeah I've been diving since I was about 10. Oh that's a great story <laughs> All right, um, from Susie, she's curious about the provisions for supporting human function in the one atmosphere suit. So how do you support hydration, urination, um, calorie intake, et cetera? Yeah, great, great question. And uh, yeah, my doc was always keen on that. So guess what? If you gotta go, you just gotta go and it's dry on the inside and you just, you go. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the, the, the way when you come up to the surface, the way you depressurize the suit, because even though it, it, it has been crushed, so it's under just a little bit of pressure, even though you're at the surface and in both one atmosphere. So you take that boot and you turn it a quarter turn and you pop it down and it's usually fully earned. Um, so uh, you, if you are planning a long dive, you wear a diaper and guess what? You defecate. Uh, there's a little water pack that you have that comes over your shoulder and goes right here. Now remember your shoulders are basically stuffed in. So it's really difficult to get in and out of and move around in that thing, but you have a little bit of room and you can do that. So uh, if you wanna eat, uh, yeah, I've known people that had taken those squeeze packs of food in there or like a, uh, a granola bar or something like that. But I mean, you know, you're, you're working, you got a job to do, you know, you'll, you'll, eat, you know, you'll sleep when you're dead and you'll eat when you're on the surface, no worries. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Um, David would like to know, do you miss the Navy? You know, it's not the Navy that I miss. I'll be frank, it's the guys. I, I miss having the camaraderie of the buddies that I used to hang out with back in the day. And, uh, hey, what are you doing tonight? I don't know, let's, let's go out on the way home or something. Or, hey, we're in a different country, let's hang out. You know, you, you don't have friends like that. I mean, you have plenty of friends, but you know, you don't have friends like that unless they were military and they've been through the same stuff. So, you know, but you always like having the guys and you'd be surprised, man. I had a guy that, you know, did a wheelie on base and goes, but sir, I didn't know that it was a that it was a problem for you to do a wheelie on base. And I'm like, you know, you're killing me, man. Because <laughs> you know, that makes that keeps life exciting. So I miss the men, but not necessarily the Navy. I moved past that after 27 years, eight months, and 19 days. <laughs> who's counting? And here's yeah, I was gonna say, who's counting? <laughs> Um, Kyle would like to know, Dr. Deturi, what do you see as the next challenge in rebreather development? <laughs> well, Dr. Kyle or Dr. 2B Kyle, I know who you are. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I did six days underwater with this man and he's a terrific human being. Um, so uh, the next uh, next thing in rebreathers, I'm gonna go with a solid state sensor, uh, which has recently been developed uh, upwards of a, a couple of years ago at this point, but uh, getting that out to uh, getting that out to the general masses of rebreathers. Uh, oxygen fluctuates a lot when you're diving, much more so than the galvanic sensors that we currently have. And a group called Poseidon or um, Cislunar Developmental Laboratories has developed a solid state sensor that basically you only need one sensor because a man with three watches doesn't know what time it is, but a man with one watch that's accurate and set to Greenwich Mean Time, they know what time it is for sure. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the sensors probably. Okay, um, another one from Harrison. Um, what is the major difference between a gym suit and an exosuit? Ah, so the exosuit, you saw those are very lightweight, highly portable. They don't weigh a whole heck of a lot. The gym suit was named after a guy named Jim Gerard back in the day. And we're not actually diving the gym suit. We're diving what we call the newt suit. So the newt suit was obviously made by Phil Newton. So uh, they, they were all different variants of those suits. There was the wasp uh, that did not have feet. The gym suit actually, I think was the first one to have feet. Do you know the reason why you have feet is only because when you lay down, you push the feet out like this and it prevents you from rolling over. That's the only reason you have feet because you can't walk in that damn suit. Everybody's like, oh, can you walk in it? I'm like, it's 1500 pounds. No, you can't walk in it. No, I'm sorry, it just doesn't, you don't just walk across the bottom, right? But that's the only reason you have feet in that suit, but that is a newt suit. And, uh, and there are some minor differences, and, uh, but a lot of similarities. It's just, it's a pressure suit, if you will, so. Excellent, okay. Um, and this is actually, so how deep is the one atmosphere suit rated and how deep has it been used? Uh, I can't answer the second question, but I can answer the first question. Uh, the, the first question is, it is rated to 2,000 feet. Um, okay. I can tell you that it may or may not have been used deeper than that. I cannot confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons on board this or any other military installation. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> I'm sorry. It just rolled right in. <laughs> yeah. Understandable. Um, okay. So from Marilyn, what are the disadvantages of rebreathers? Oh boy. So remember I told you about that sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, that, that hydroxide that you need to bond with the weak carbonic acid that comes out of your breath. And basically you have to bond with that and then capture those carbon dioxide molecules. Well, that, that uh, in and of itself is a very caustic material and it's exothermic. So if you use something like lithium hydroxide, it heats up exceptionally. And you want to know why the curse engine room exploded. We know why the Kursk bow exploded because that was like a missile, uh, a missile, a, 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 a torpedo that cooked off and the bow exploded. But the people in the engine room stayed alive for a long period of time. Well, they had a problem because they spread lithium hydroxide out in cookie sheets, which is standard operating procedure, and they, they absorbed the carbon dioxide. But some of that spilled into the bilge, which had a little bit of oil, and there was a lot of heat, and that kind of set off a chain reaction of fire in the bilge. So that stuff is completely exothermic, and it's caustic. So that's one of the disadvantages. I mean, every rebreather I've ever seen has tried to kill me in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> There's a great warning. This device will happily and gleefully kill you. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of bad issues with rebreathers, but the, the benefits, in Joe's opinion, outweigh the risks. Excellent. No, that's good to know. Um, can you tell us more about COVID research? How close are you to offering something to the public? Are you looking for funding? Joanna, a student of yours. Oh, hi, Joanna. How are you? <laughs> I hope you have the kids watching. That's fabulous. So, yes. Um, all right. So, yes, I'm looking for funding. Hi, my name is Joe. I need funding. But I'm a, I'm a poor researcher. So, University of South Florida gave us a little bit of money. Uh, we got some seed funding at this point. So, basically, what we're doing is COVID, COVID has two phases. I believe, Joe's opinion, is that it could help with the preliminary phases of COVID and helping with the oxygenation. But that's a short-term fix. The biggest problem, and mark my words, everybody on this screen, think about it. It is the long haulers for COVID that is going to plague this world 
for the next 20 friggin' years, I'm telling you. But it's fixing these people. I had a, uh, I had a single woman that, uh, I had one woman, not a single woman. Uh, I had one woman that was uh, in mid forties and uh, she needed to go do something. And it turned out that uh, she couldn't go in for this one particular operation that she was in for. And, uh, and they said, hey, your FEV1 scores, your breathing scores are not good enough. And she came into my facility and she was like, I just, I need a little bit of help because I really, I can't really breathe so well. And I was like, wow, this is profound. So lung x-ray, do, do a couple of things and then make sure that she's okay. I said, look, I don't know if it's gonna help, but I'm definitely willing to try. So we did some spirometry on her beforehand and some spirometry on her afterwards. Well, I'll tell you that five treatments into hyperbaric oxygen therapy, five. I couldn't shut her up. And she's like, you're the greatest in the world. Blah, 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 blah. So we treated her for a total of 10 treatments. And what we did was we raised her FEV1 score, effectively the amount that you can breathe, from 67 to 92. And it, it gave her the opportunity to go in for that surgery. The anesthesiologist was like, I can't believe you had this much of a profound change in that short period of time. She's like, my brain fog is gone. My lethargy is gone. My substernal irritation is gone. My reduced vital capacity is gone. I can run. She was a marathoner and, you know, and I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. So it looks like it works. Look, man, I'm a scientist. This may or may not work, but, and it may not, may not work for anybody, but, or everybody, but, Hey man, I'm willing to try it. And uh, you know, if you're willing to try, we have physicians on board that are able to treat in Tampa, Florida area, or just approach your local hyperbaric center and see if you can get a little bit of treatment. But the old saying is green gas is good gas and oxygen's green gas, so. Excellent. And so obviously you guys are doing that in Tampa and someone actually, that this was another question. Who else is doing this kind of research or is it really just you guys? So we, uh, there are plenty of people that are doing the pre-COVID research. NYU was doing it. Louisiana State University is doing it. Uh, Temple was doing a project. Uh, if, you, if you look on the NCITI website or whatever that place is, uh, they're the ones that tell you all the clinical trials that are going on. But to the best of my knowledge, nobody is using it to treat post-COVID or okay. COVID long haulers because we just stumbled upon this. This woman came to us from a primary care provider and said, hey, I, I need help. And I'm like, listen, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure if it's going to work, but the mechanism of action is this and maybe. So we rolled the dice and it looked like it came out good. And, you know, so we got a little bit of seed funding from USF and we're going to see, man, we might, we might kick the door down with this one. This could be cool. <laughs> Excellent. Um, R. James is wondering, um, do you have any comments on the film Last Breath? The film Last Breath, oh boy. So, um, wow, is all I have to say. Uh, I, I, got, I got nothing else. It, it's just, it's one of those things where you go, yeah, that actually happened. And mm, my God, I, I take a deep breath and realize that, so, so divers get paid what we call hazardous duty pay. And you get paid that for a good damn reason because it's hazardous duty to be doing that kind of stuff. Case in point, watch that movie. If you haven't watched it, oh my gosh. It's on Netflix for, for those of you who haven't seen it. We won't give anything away, yeah. but <laughs> like you said, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, from, and I'm sorry if I say this wrong, Hab, Habibi, I apologize if I butchered that. Um, what's the longest any person has actually stayed submerged? Like, do you know what the record is for that? I'm, and I'm guessing they're referencing in a one atmosphere suit. So in a one atmosphere suit, it's about eight hours. Underwater, it's 73 straight days. So uh, 73 straight days. And interestingly enough, we are working with the deep spot, which is in the Czech Republic, to break that world record wide open. And we're gonna go a hundred freaking days living underwater in that habitat. So stand by for heavy rolls because <laughs> we're gonna do cool things. Awesome. Um, Susie was wondering um, when transitioning collected biological samples from deeper water to the surface, are there any special provisions taken? Ah, yeah. So when you're in an open circuit getup, now you cannot do this when you're in the one atmosphere suit, but when you're in, a, in an open circuit or a uh, closed circuit rebreather, you absolutely need. So what we would do is we would, <laughs> you would take the fish that you'd pull them out of the bucket, you'd turn them upside down, you'd flip them, and you'd have to perforate the swim bladder. 
So I would take it out and it's basically floating upside down going, oh, right? And I'd throw it to Rich and Rich in his watch band had hypodermic needles. Could you imagine being pulled over by a cop and no going, no, 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 I'm an ichthyologist. These are hypodermic needles for inserting into fish bladders. You could just see this, right? So he'd insert it into the fish bladder and the bubbles would and then he'd throw the fish back to me and then I'd throw him another one and shove that one back in. <laughs> so you have to basically decompress the fish's swim bladder because it's a gas space that's expanding. It helps keep them neutral and oh yeah, every 33 feet or so you'd have to stop. Interestingly enough, that was the origin of deep spots, deep stops, because the deep decompression stops were held because when we caught fish, we didn't get decompression sickness from these 120, 130 meter dives initially. And then we're like, well, why didn't we catch, when we caught fish, we didn't get the decompression uh, problems. But turns out that that was the origin of deep spots and that whole, that whole biomedical engineering paper that came out of that, that, that logged deep stops, so. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, and now I've got another one um, from John. What type or which treatment tables do, did you use on the lady? Oh, on the lady. Okay, so we did um, 60 minutes, and this will be our research study. 60 minutes, 2.0 PO2 um, with a 10 minute descent and a 10 minute descent and a six minute ascent. Uh, but it's PO2 at 2.0 PO2 for a bottom time of 60 minutes, six zero. Okay, excellent. Do I Profound have any results? <laughs> no, that sounds like one, right? That one person that said it up. <laughs> I mean, more people have done it, but. Um, so does anyone else have questions? Because if that, if for a while they were like coming in so quickly and then you were answering them so quickly. And now I'm like, oh, <laughs> everybody I think is like enjoying all the information. <laughs> Even though I, I know I have a few trusty people that I know I can always rely on for questions. I am a commonwealth of useless information. Feel free to ask away. I got, I got more I got more regalia. I will regale you with my story. Ah, and just like I thought I'd rely on him. Um, Kurt has another question. Are you writing a book? <laughs> oh my goodness. So why yes, Kurt, thank you for that uh, that that uh, perfect setup like a poof. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, so I've been writing a book for the past 15 years and it was time. Uh, finally, it's time to uh, get this all down on paper. And I hired a guy and I was like, this is the year that I'm doing this and I'm going to put that thing out. By the end of this year, it's going to be a thriller, um, you know, sort of a factional, sort of a, this stories may never have happened. Maybe they just happened in my mind. You never really know. But there's a lot of good detail and it's about the one atmosphere suit and uh, lots of cool, cool things. I can tell you this. The doctor's name in it is Dartos. And if you can email me with what Dartos means, I'll, uh, I'll send you a little present. That's <laughs> the first thing you can email me with what Dartos means, um, you will, uh, you'll, get, you'll get a little present from, uh, from uh, the, the uh, diving museum that will go from me through the diving museum. There we go. <laughs> so you can email the diving museum and send it to me. We'll get it, right? <laughs> You all know how to contact me because you all did already. So <laughs> I'm going to get a slew of emails now in the next few hours. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> uh, nothing but love. Nothing but love. I know. Um, Harrison also had a question. Um, what are your thoughts on undersea habitats? Undersea habitats. So that's basically what we're designing and building. We're building a uh, a, uh, a simple atmosphere um, habitat that we have that uh, we don't have to lock in and out of. It's basically a bell, but it's a huge bell uh, that we're going to live in for a period of 100 days. So look, man, if you've ever worked on your car or something like that, you get the toolbox out, you walk over, you pull the tools out, you open it all up, and then you know you scrape your knuckles on the ground just so that you can have bloody knuckles because you always end up with bloody knuckles when you end up working on your car. And then you get the tools and you crawl underneath the car, and that way you got to go back out, you got to jack it back up a little further, and then do something a little bit more. It, it takes you like 30 minutes to get going on something. Well, when you're going to 100 meters, you only have 30 minutes. You max have 30 minutes. If you go to 40 minutes, you're talking about an eight hour decompression profile. It's ridiculous. So, you know, you don't have a lot of time to get things going. So remember the, the 
the better you look, the more you're going to see. If you look in that same spot, you're only going to see the same stuff you've always seen. So if you always go down and then come back up, you're just going to see that same thing you've always seen. But if you live there, if you live in the ocean, we're going to see stuff that we haven't seen. We're going to see snakes that come out of the ground. We're going to see invertebrates that are, that are walking around at night, smoking cigarettes underwater. I have no idea what we're going to see, but we're going to see something that we don't normally see. So it's kind of, it's kind of neat to know that if you live in that environment, that you're going to see some cool stuff. So Joe's opinion. Uh oh, Lisa's popping back in. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, mom. So I feel like TikTok. I know. So I've got, we'll do, I'll do three more questions. And though, and Kurt maybe has an answer to your, <laughs> your captain's name. Um, can, can you explain more of the in, in canal metal? The Inconel metal. So it's a cross between nickel and monel, and there is a slight amount of metal in it, but what it is, is it's a non-ferrous metal, but it's, uh, it's, it's a blend therein. And these spheres are fashioned and poured. Um, and like, you, you know how you hydrostatically test a scuba diving cylinder? You shouldn't hydrostatically test these things. Well, hydrostatically testing, we pressurize them, we overpressurize them. You know, the, the, we, we actually did some um, experimental destructive testing on these Inconel spheres. And the, the, the highest, the lowest pressure that we were able to get one to even have a, a slight crack in the well was 9,000 PSI. So realistically, they're, they're a great shape for holding pressure. Not that I would store oxygen at 9,000 PSI, but that's just me. But, um, you know, they're, they're a, great, uh, a great shape for holding pressure and they're good for volume. So you can squeeze them into a place and they're nice to carry around. It's, you know, so. And if, and if Kirk's answer has something to do with the male genitalia, he's correct. <laughs> Kirk, sir, I owe you something. <laughs> I'll put you two in contact. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have to say what he was typing to me. <laughs> um, all right, my last two, my real qu last two questions from folks, Susie, <laughs> um, wanted to know what emergency procedures are in place in case the tether management system fails. Oh boy, yeah, the tether management system fails. We've had that happen one time uh, with the outgoing uh, officer in charge, Keith. Um, and his TMS could not roll up and latch. So he was basically hanging off this, hanging off the rope the entire time from 2000 feet back to the surface. So it's a 30 minute ride, give or take to get back up to the surface. And can you imagine this on your, sitting on your bicycle seat? For, <laughs> oh my goodness. So yeah, it's very bad. There's, a, uh, there's, a, there's an external latch that you can use. Um, and then what happened was, as a matter of fact, that video that you saw of me in the water, I was the guy that jumped in the water, fashioned or last lashed it to the actual uh, tether management system so that he stopped that, but that was, we were diving at depth and then they brought it up and over and then they, uh, they let him down. But uh, it's a really dangerous operation. If that TMS doesn't work, really bad things happen. So once again, that's why you get pro pay and hazardous duty pay, woohoo. <laughs> All right, and the last one from R. James. Um, what's being done for saturation divers and HPNS, which you might have to explain what HPNS is. Yeah, that's right. It's high pressure nervous syndrome, and it's uh, it's basically a neuro neurological problem that happens when you breathe uh, different kinds of gases. In this particular case, um, he's talking about helium. Uh, it's been seen on hydrogen as well, but it's not seen any shallower than about 300 feet. And I believe, Joe's opinion, I believe it has something to do with the, um, the, um, <clears throat> the inert gas and the fat solubility of that particular gas. So it's really kind of a, it's really kind of a hard problem. The, the problem is, look, it's, it's a compression rate thing. So if you compress really quickly, you will probably get HPNS. If you compress slowly, you might get HPNS. So we're kind of sort of working around this thing. Nobody's doing any research on it because look, honest to God, there are 12 people diving in the world. You know, maybe there's 12,000 people diving in the world, but there's not a lot that have an HPNS problem. So 
you know, when we have real problems, then, you know, the community comes to us and says, we need to solve these. But right now the HPNS seems to be ostensibly under control and we're kind of, uh, they seem to be working with compression rates and, and going slowly enough, but, you know, oh, the thing is, it's also, it's, it's habitual. So if you have HPNS, we have seen that you will always have HPNS and we're not really sure how to get rid of it per se, but I don't know. The answer is I don't know. I got a lot of I don't knows, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You gave us a lot of other information though too, so it evens out. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna remove this and we're going to come back into this. And Lisa- hey, All your guys' questions, if you have questions uh, that- I can uh, direct them to you. Okay, so you're back on Lisa. Hi, Lisa. I'm sorry I went over, Mom. No. <laughs> it's no problem, actually. It was very informative. It, there were great questions. Usually I ask a couple questions, and there were so many very thought out, thorough ones that I'm still like, let everybody else take care yeah. of this. So, <laughs> hey, it was great. It was really good. Good. So um, we want to thank you. Thank everybody for participating. And mm -hmm. as a uh, History of Diving Museum Immerse Yourself speaker, we offer you a one year extended membership. Yay! So basically we're, you already are a member. So now you're renewing for another year. So thank you, we'll get you a, a rockstar t-shirt. So at some point when you're diving, you can be diving in uh, an HDM billboard <laughs> and uh, taking it on some of your missions. So thanks very much, Joe. Yes, ma'am, absolutely, we'll do that. And look, I gotta, I gotta put a shout out to you guys because doing this kind of stuff during these times and educating people and just putting the word out there and doing interesting stuff, we're all stuck at home and it stinks. But if you can get interesting speakers like you've had, not necessarily me, but if you can get more interesting, <laughs> more better speakers, uh, be, that would be really cool. And, uh, and people like tuning in. And I've come to the starting realization that if I just do this once a year, I'll never actually have to have a, um, a membership. <laughs> <laughs> See everybody. <laughs> there you go. Good thought. Well, thank right. you very much. I really appreciate it. And if you have any of those, my daddy wears a different kind of suit uh, books for him. Mm -hmm. Kurt certainly earned that one for sure. And uh, definitely and, pass that around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you can hook, hook him up. <laughs> I will hook him up. Yes. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your time, effort, and the great questions. What a group of great yeah. questions. It was very good. Very good. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for attending. And like we said, we'll have Eric Denson from Diving with a Purpose next month. So, you know, if you want to start signing up, I'll get you on the list and we'll go from there. But other than that, thank you for attending and we'll see you guys next month. See ya. Bye guys. Bye.